Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Moving through the uh, days of Ramadan, traveling purposefully through the desert uh, every evening, being hospitably welcomed by the oasis, and on we travel, the journey. It is a journey towards the Eid and the outward uh, rejoicing and celebrating the hope of Allah's Qabul and of his acceptance and of a return to Bast after Qabd, expansion after constriction, but also a journey within. Every outward form in religion enacts and reminds us of uh, an inward process of turning and transformation. It is always about Tawheed, about Tawbah, about Istighfar. So the prayer leads us through the process of being erect in our normal human uh, life, standing as bipeds through the sajda of inkisar, brokenness, annihilation before the Divine Majesty. And we end in a position of equilibrium. This is one of the meanings of كَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا Thus have we made you a middle nation that we end up uh, halfway between these two possibilities of apparently autonomous, ambulant humanity and prostrate self-annihilation in the presence of the divine. And this is one meaning of the hadith that says, as salatu mi'raj al-mu'min, the prayer is the mi'raj of the believer. And the prayer, of course, in the hadith was gifted to the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the night of the Mi'raj, which is historically commemorated in the weeks prior to the month of Ramadan, that there is uh, the aspect of khilafah in this and the aspect of serenity. The last word of the prayer is, Assalamu alaikum, the invocation of peace. Equilibrium has been restored. Similarly, at the end of the fast, after this cycle of abstention and gratitude, sabr and shukr, we have their combination as we return purified, inshallah, chastened, rejoicing, as we return to our quotidian uh, routines. But in all of this, there is the process of moving forward. Ramadan is not just something that we do that is awkward, that disrupts our routine in order to earn treats in heaven. It would be a strange thing for the divine to give us only that. But instead it's an inward journey that leaves a permanent trace on the soul. So Ramadan should not be a step up into a more heavenly space followed by a step down after the Eid, but it should be a step up that enables us to take a further step up the following year. So that as we move on in life, Ramadan becomes a more and more amazing, natural, transformative experience rather than just uh, circular. So uh, in order for this journey really to be a journey, rather than just a wandering around in, in circles every year, we have to make sure that we know what it is for so that we can make the right kind of niya. Just saying, I intend to fast tomorrow is formally correct, but unless the heart really knows what are the expected benefits of the fast, something is being lost. Just as the prayer is legitimately started by the intention of saying the Maghrib prayer, but unless the heart really knows the immensity of this prophetic act and approaches it in gratitude and reverence, something is lost. It's as if we are legalists and routinized religion, turning it into a kind of cosmic slot machine. So we put in our amal and we get out treats at the end of our life. And that's really a rather strange reason for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have created human beings in this ahsan taqweem and to have sent them prophets and anbiya and awliya and ulama. Now there's more to this than meets the eye. So what is it that Ramadan is leading us towards? Well, it's leading us towards evidently the gift of sabr, a sawmu, this for sabr, in the Tirmidhi hadith that the fasting is half of sabr and it teaches us the rather extraordinary lesson which for most of the year we are reluctant to consider which is that actually we are able to say no to things. Normally we say I have to have this indulgence, 
I need this new car, I need this holiday, and I'm tired, and I need to chill and to have these treats. And actually, that's not the best part of us talking, though. Ramadan tells us that we do have the capacity to say, uh, nil by mouth, from dawn until dusk, not even drinking and even controlling the thoughts and our habits of speech. It's very radical. So by the end of the month, we've actually learnt this formal lesson that with Allah's uh, name, Al-Qawi, he reinforces us actually to be able to say no to the ego. That's an important lesson. It should help us to overcome the pessimism, the lassitude which we often feel, that, these, that this nafs amara is just too strong and I can't deal with it, so I'm going to do religion on a kind of minimal level because uh, things are just too tough and I'm feeling sorry for myself. No, Ramadan teaches that you can actually do a lot. You can do a lot more prayers, you can do a lot of abstaining from pleasures. Human beings have this capacity and Ramadan proves that to us. So that's a real gift and we need to learn from that and remember it when we're tempted to return to indulgences and forms of laziness and saying yes to the ego at, at other times of the year. We know that we can do better than that. There's no excuse. So there is that journey, the journey towards a greater respect, I think, for the capacity of the human will, the irada, uh, to prevail over the nafs, the, the lower ego. It's, it's proved in this month. But also the inward journey, which is the journey uh, towards uh, khilafa, towards being Allah's uh, approved organism in uh, the world of dunya. That entity, that Adamic miracle to which, to whom the angels could bow down. That strange enigmatic passage in the Quran that uh, if it appeared, say, in a medieval Persian poem, a lot of our brothers would say, Astaghfirullah, shirk, haram, but it's there at the beginning of the Qur'an. Commands them, anisjudu li Adam, prostrate to Adam. Fasajadu ila Iblis, abba wa stakbara wa kana minal kafirin. They all bowed down, but Iblis didn't. He refused and was proud and was one of the unbelievers, those who literally cover up reality. Now, if you look at that verse, you'll see that the reason why he does it uh, is not that he's getting involved in some kind of misunderstanding of Tawheed, but rather that he thinks is too good for this process. Abba was takbara. He considered himself to be Kabir, although the divine name Al-Kabir applies only to the divine subhanahu wa ta'ala. He alone is Al-Jabbar, uh, the Kibriya is his alone. Lahu mulku samawati wal ard. And any human being that thinks that he's really some kind of special person uh, has arrogated to himself something that is a uniquely divine trait. He alone is the source of being, the author of time, the, the underlying principle behind every movement that exists in the heavens and the earth. He alone, he is al-kabir, al-mutakabir even. He alone has the right to do that. So the shaitan, in this pride, is immediately indicating what can go wrong with us. The worst of the seven deadly sins, superbia, pride, arrogance. We know best, and we see this now in this whole civilization that we're inhabiting at this particular rather extreme stage of the human story. Human beings with this sovereign autonomy preached by the Enlightenment, our lack of need uh, for the wisdom uh, and the sagacity of the past and of the sages and of the prophets. We alone know what's right. <clears throat> With our science, it turns out that we are so smart that we can even destroy the biosphere, kill dozens of species every month, re-engineer species, perhaps re-engineer ourselves. We're so smart that we're facing extinction. That's the smartness of the one who will not bow down to the clay spiritualized creature and humanity at the moment is going through the final meltdown point of this individualism. Mm. This ana khairun min, I am better. The one who knows best, who thinks that he can second guess the divine commandment. God says one thing but I'm going to do something else because 
the dignity of the will. It's just ego, it's just pride. It's from Fir'aun, who refuses to accept even the signs of Musa alayhi salam and wants to build a tower because in his scientific mindset that's the way in which you get to see whether there is a divine entity, a fundamental category mistake, and it's the nature of the ignorance of this age, and it's messing human beings up, it's messing family life up, it's messing up people's sense of national belonging, it's messing up the biosphere. This is an age of chaos and confusion. But the basic reason for this is ego, self-might, as William Blake calls it, this fiery sense of, I know, I'm not going to accept the authority of anything else, tradition, or the sages, or the ijma, or the madhab, or whatever it might be. I know best. And there are religious expressions of this. The one who thinks that is so cool that he can ignore all of the wisdom of the jurists and come up with some new fatwa, thinking, I know the Qur'an and the Sunnah better than all of these people, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and Suyuti and Ghazali. I know best. So often fundamentalism is a very modern kind of phenomenon because it uh, empowers the sovereign individual human will and says you can know better than the consensus of the scholars of bygone ages. You alone have authority of the Qur'an and the Sunnah to understand what they mean. So even religion has succumbed to this age of ego, age of self, age of self-might. So in the month of Ramadan we are told uh, that the shayateen which teach us this nonsense about pride and self, are chained up and we're a little bit broken. It's hard to be really arrogant and proud when you're hungry and thirsty and the days are long and you're feeling uh, the blood sugar level is low. It's hard to be really arrogant and proud in that situation. That brokenness is what we need. So when we're in that state and we can see ourselves in perspective and see the consequences of our pride and how inhuman it is, unhuman and inhuman, then we can start to move back and start to move into the situation not of pride before the divine, which is an absurdity, but the brokenness that leads to prostration before the divine, which is the natural state of obudiyya of humanity and of the chosen one, alayhi salatu salam, who is Abdullah, inni Abdullah, the slave of God. Now this obodiya is related to this process of, of return to the divine. Ibadah, including the siyam, is all about returning to where and how we were in the alam al-arwah before insolment in the world when the flesh made the possibility of sin and anger and pride a possibility. So it's about returning to a garden-like state taking us away from the fiery state of the one whose uh, selfhood is determined by ego and passion of various kinds. It's like the, the fire of God that rises up above the heart. The angry person and the jealous person and the fearful person, they're consumed by these flames. This is certainly an age of anxiety, an age of depression, an age of envy and an age of a lack of serenity and stillness and acceptance of, of the divine truth and, and, and of the appropriateness of the divine decree in every age. We are uh, uncomfortable. So in order to get back to that, we use the word wilaya. Mm -hmm. And we have to be wali, awliya which is a very frequently used Qur'anic sense. And this is why the angels were able to bow down to that, that creature that seemed to be made of perishable mud and clay, the lowest thing. But when nafakhna fihi mir ruhina, we breathed into him something of our spirit. And therefore, this strange theological paradox of bowing down to a creature became not just possible, but a divine command. So this wilaya, is where we need to be because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna awliya allahi la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahsanun Verily the awliya of Allah there is no fear upon them neither do they grieve That's what we all want Fear is anxiety about the future 
what's going to happen about Brexit, what will UKIP do next, what is happening with extremism, what's happening with global warming, anxiety. We need to take precautions and be aware of the future. That work isn't possible unless we know possible outcomes. Uh, but this endless fearful agitation is a denial of the divine decree and it should not settle in the believer's heart. So we lay is about the assuaging and the calming of our inward anxieties and fearful, uh, fearfulness. But also, وَلَهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And they are not sad. They are not endlessly revisiting the past and anxious about what they should have done, what they didn't do, and trying to reinvent <coughs> the past, which ultimately is in the divine decree. So they are in the moment, not panicking about the future, not panicking about the past, absolutely in the moment, because the moment is all that's real. And we have to be Ibn al-Waqt, attentive, mindful to the miracle of the moment, because the future is, who knows what it will be, the past you can't do anything about. Be in the moment. Now, the modern world tends to focus us very much on possible outcomes and uh, seduces us and anaesthetizes us with talk about the future. If you buy this, you will get that. If you pursue this career option, then there will be this door open to you, etc. And we dream <coughs> with this tamenni, this thinking about the future. And that tends to make us spaced out and unreal and uncentered, and that is one reason for our anxiety. But this wilaya is about being completely in a state of appropriate connectedness and nearness to the divine. The wali is the one who is close. Imam Qushayri rahmatullahi alayhi says, has another sense of this, which is al-waliyu man tawalat af'aluhu al muwafaqa The wali is the one whose uh, actions succeed each other uninterruptedly in conformity to the sunnah. In other words, you're not good one day and bad the next, you mess up and then you get back. No, you're in a state of consistent uh, compliance with the divine decree. So that's one meaning of the wali. And necessarily the one who is wali is the one who is in that state because it's irrational and impossible for him really to be tempted by the silliness of disobedience and the, to follow the flames of, of, of the lower self. But as we progress, we recognize that there is a journey uh, in our faith that Ramadan should represent and facilitate, which is the journey represented by the famous Hadith and Nawafil. It is one of the great Hadiths of Islam and it's a Hadith Qudsi. Rawal Bukhari an Abi Hurayrata radiallahu an and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal fima yarwihi ar rabbihi jalla wa ala man adha li waliyan faqad adhantuhu bil harb. وَلَا يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَدْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ ثُمَّ لَا يَزَالُ يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ حَتَّى أُحِبَّ فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُ كُنْتُ سَمْعَهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ وَبَصَرَهُ الَّذِي يُبْصِرُ بِهِ وَيَدَهُ الَّتِي يَبْطِشُ بِهَا وَرِجْلَهُ الَّتِي يَمْشِي عَلَيْهَا وَلَئِنْ اسْتَعَاذَ بِي لَأُعِيذَنَّ وَلَئِنْ اسْتَنْصَرَنِي لَأَنْصُرَنَّ إلى آخر الحديث In this hadith Qudsi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying Whoever harms a wali of mine, somebody who is in this state of constant attentiveness to the time and whose desire for anger, for rage, for envy, uh, for getting his own back, for vengeance has all gone and is just in the moment accepting the divine decree. Uh, whoever harms such a person, I make war on him. And anybody who attacks those awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, catastrophes will come. This is uh, visible throughout our history. And then the hadith continues. My servant draws near to me with nothing more beloved to me than that which I have made an obligation upon him. So through these obligations, including fast, fasting, we draw near to him and Allah loves those actions. We may not still be very lovable because we're not getting them right, we're not inhabiting them properly, we're going through the motions. But the divine love is for the action, for the outward form of what we're complying to. And then the hadith continues, and my slave draws near, continues to draw to me with optional acts of devotion until they love him. So when on top of that, when the beauty of those actions has become so clear that we want to do more and more, and we want to inhabit them more and more authentically, Allah loves not just the act, but the one who is performing the act, in other words, he loves us. So this mahabba, this divine love, is, seems to be at the center of this process of moving forward through our ibadat. 
And then it says, and when I love him, I become the eye with which he sees and the ear with which he hears and the hand with which he strikes and the foot on which he walks, which means he's constantly in compliance. Whatever he does with his limbs is in compliance with, with the, the sunnah, with muwafaqah, and is in the st- st- state of loving closeness to the divine and distance from revenge and passion and vengefulness and, and anger and all of those other ugly things, which are the satanic things that prevent the prostration. And if he seeks my protection, I will certainly grant it him. And if he seeks my support, I will certainly grant it him. This is what we need. And this is the message and the moral and the beauty of Ramadan. Overcome that ego, be truly in the space of accepting the sabr, accept the divine decree, overcome those passions and that vengefulness and that flame within and you will become supported by the divine and this is what the ummah needs. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this an, uh, a Ramadan of real sabr, of real suluk, of real wayfaring, of real journeying towards his good pleasure inshallah and accept all of our fasting and our Quran and our taraweeh and our ikram inshallah. Barakallahu fikum wal afu minkum wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.